My brave lad, he sleeps in his faded coat of blue. In a lonely grave alone lies the heart that beats so true. They will find him and know him amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue. No more the blue. Welcome to War of the Rebellion, Stories of the Civil War. I am your host, Leon Meowser, and this is a reading of the regimental history under the Maltese Cross Antietam to Appomattox, the Loyal Uprising in Western Pennsylvania, 1861 to 1865, Campaign's 155th Pennsylvania Regiment, narrated by the rank and file. This is, my goodness, episode 20, chapter 10. Retreat of the Confederate Army Confederate Army retreats across Potomac Regulars sent to New York Execution of five deserters Army of Potomac and Confederate Army maneuver for position Union Army moves towards Orange Courthouse Preparations for battle Union Army withdraws. Winter corridors at Warrington Junction. Incidents of Mine Run Campaign. Colonel Edwin M. Gregory of 91st Pennsylvania becomes commander of brigade. New Year's Day, 1864, in camp. 155th receives Zouave uniform. Lieutenant Colonel Pearson assumes command of regiment. Regiment complimented for proficiency tactics by General Garrard. Description of Zouave uniform. Religious exercises in camp. Drowning of Captain Joseph B. Sackett, commanding Company E. Impressive military funeral. Regiment transferred to 1st Brigade, 1st Division, 5th Corps. Major General Governor K. Warren succeeds General Sykes as commander of 5th Corps. Farewell address of General Sykes. Orders received to break camp. General Ayers commands 1st Division, now consolidated to brigade. 5th Corps camps for the night on outskirts of wilderness. On the morning of the 4th day of July, 1863, the 3rd Brigade, 2nd Division, 5th Corps, to which Colonel Garrard had succeeded General Weed in command, together with the 6th United States Regulars of the 2nd Brigade, same division, was ordered on a reconnaissance in front of Little Round Top. Moving about a mile to the front, through the wheat field, it was found that Lee was still holding a strong position towards the center of the line, thus leaving the contested grounds of the battlefield of the three days previous all within the Union line, as stated, for a mile in front of Little Round Top. While this advance of the 5th Corps was being developed, General Slocum had made a reconnaissance on the right and discovered that the Confederates had wholly withdrawn from the front of the right of the army. It is presumed that General Lee rather hoarded an attack from General Meade at this time, but the latter was too clear-headed to give up his defensive position when he knew that General Lee must attack him or run away. As already stated, the remainder of the 4th of July was fully occupied by the Union Army in getting up its large wagon trains with supplies and ammunition, caring for the wounded, burying the dead, and putting things in order generally for immediate pursuit of the Confederates. Instead of pursuing the Confederates on the direct line of their retreat, the Union Army made a flank movement by the east side of South Mountain. Lee's army, by direct march, reached Williamsport on the 7th of July, two days after retreating from Gettysburg, and finding that its pontoon bridge had been destroyed by the Union Cavalry, and the river, swollen to a height of seven feet by recent rains, immediately threw up entrenchments and strongly fortified its position. The Union Army, having crossed South Mountain, did not reach the vicinity of Williamsport until the 12th, thus affording the enemy nearly a week in which to further strengthen its works 
and prepare for an expected attack. Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, July 4th, 1863. General Orders, Number 68. The Commanding General, in behalf of the country, thanks the Army of the Potomac for the glorious result of the recent operations. An enemy superior in numbers and flushed with the pride of a successful invasion, attempted to overcome and destroy this army. Utterly baffled and defeated, he is now withdrawn from the contest. The privations and fatigue the army has endured, and the heroic courage and gallantry it has displayed will be matters of history to be ever remembered. Our task is not yet accomplished, and the commanding general looks to the army for greater efforts to drive from our soil every vestige of the presence of the invader. It is right and proper that we should, on all suitable occasions, return our grateful thanks to the almighty disposer of events, that in the goodness of his providence he has thought fit to give us victory to the cause of the just. By the command of Major General Meade, S. Williams, Assistant Adjutant General. Facsimile of Meade's announcement of his victory over Lead at Gettysburg from the original in possession of Judge Samuel W. Pennypacker. 155th, in line of battle with other regiments of Ayers Division, advanced several miles before coming into contact with the Confederates in their entrenchments. The brigade and division immediately began to fortify preparatory to assaulting the enemy's works. No movement was made, however, until the 13th of July, when the skirmishers along the line became engaged with the enemy and Union troops prepared to make an assault. No orders to attack, however, came before the morning of the 14th when, on the advance of the Union troops, the Confederate works were found to be deserted. Lee's army, having retreated across the Potomac at Falling Waters, a short distance from Williamsport during the previous night. The results of the campaign, in pursuit of Lee by the V Corps, were several hundred prisoners, captured from the enemy's rearguard before they could cross the river. The Confederates also sustained a great loss in the death of General Pettigrew, who had led a brigade in Pickett's recent charge at Gettysburg. After crossing the enemy's works in the morning of the 14th, three brave boys of Company K, E, A, Calhoun, and R. O. and G. H. Clever, while passing a house, saw through a window several Confederates enjoying a good breakfast before taking their departure for Virginia. The Company K boys captured the entire squad. Council of War after a council of war on the night of the 13th of July, at which were present Generals John Sedgwick, John Newton, George Sykes, H.W. Slocum, O.O. O. Howard, D.B. Burney, G.K. Warren, Chief Engineer, A.A. A. Humphreys, Chief of Staff H.J. Hunt, Chief of Artillery, and John Gibbon, succeeding Hancock in command of the 2nd Corps, the strength of the enemy's fortifications and natural defenses were discussed, resulting in quite a division of opinion as to the chances of success in case of an assault by the Union Army upon the Confederate strongholds. General Meade was from the first favorable to the assault, but was induced to delay by the many arguments adduced against it until the end of the council when he gave the order to attack. The 14th was spent in preparing for the assault but when the advance was began, no enemy was found, the Confederates having retreated during the night. The enemy's works were found to be of the most formidable character, exhibiting the highest military skill and engineering and construction. It was a matter of deep regret, and view of later developments as to Lee's condition, that he should have been allowed to escape once more to southern soil. There must have been a sting in the remark said to have been made by President Lincoln to General Meade and his corps commanders shortly afterwards that the fruit seemed so right, so ready for the plucking, that it was very hard to lose it. The next day, July 15th, the army was again on the move, marching 26 miles across South Mountain. The next day, 
the V Corps moved down the Potomac to Berlin, and towards evening crossed the river on pontoons, and the 155th was again on old Virginia soil. For the next few days, the V Corps moved along the Ludun Valley amidst the marvelous profusion of blackberries. The 155th ate blackberries for breakfast, for dinner, and for supper. There appeared to be berries enough to supply several armies. During the night bivouacs, the boys exercised their ingenuity in making blackberry shortcake out of crushed hardtack and berries. On the 24th of July, the Third Corps, commanded by General French, had a skirmish with the enemy at Wapping Heights near Piedmont in the mountains. Lee's army was retreating up the Shenandoah Valley, and General Meade ordered General French to make a flank attack on the Confederate columns through a pass in the mountains. General French was so dilatory in obeying this order that the enemy's columns had all passed the point of the proposed attack before French reached the position. His advance consisted of a brigade of Hooker's old corps, who, as they moved forward towards the crest which the rear guard of Lee's troops were defending, coolly loaded and fired, then ate blackberries a while, then loaded and fired, and moved onward and up a few steps, then ate more blackberries, all the while ridiculing their general. On the morning of the 25th of July, the Fifth Corps advanced in line of battle toward the Confederate position, but with the exception of some desultory skirmishing at a few points along the line with scouting parties of the enemy, no firing took place, the main body of the Confederate rear guard having retreated during the night. After various marches and movements of little interest to the general reader, but very trying to the patience of the soldiers, the Fifth Corps and the other corps of the army retraced their steps through the mountain gap, and moving by way of Warrington, went into camp at Beverly Ford on the Rappahannock on August 6, 1863. Two Brigades, United States Regular, sent to New York. On the 13th of August, 1863, the two brigades of the United States Regulars, under General R.B. Ayers, were, with other troops, detached and sent to New York. It was expected that General Ayers' entire division, with guards, brigade, and the 155th, would be included in this New York detail, but at the eleventh hour, the plan was changed and only the regular brigades were sent. The object of this detail was to preserve and restore order in New York City after the reign of terror produced by the memorable draft riots. On the 20th of August, 1863, five deserters from the 118th Pennsylvania, belonging to the Fifth Corps, were executed. The solemn affair took place in an immense meadow shaped like a large amphitheater. Orders were issued for the parading of as many regiments of the Fifth Corps as could be spared from picket and other duties. Five graves had been dug and a coffin placed beside each grave. All were attended by ministers of their own faith, two being Catholic, two Protestant, and the fifth was a Jew. After the procession had been formed and the parade to the place of execution had taken place, the prisoners riding in an open army ambulance alighted and were then seated on their coffins. The firing party, consisting of sixteen files of men, were drawn up in front of the place of execution within sixty feet of the condemned men. The bearing of all these individuals was firm and steady, except the Jew, whose form of praying seemed to be hysterical, causing him to appear to be completely overcome. After a few minutes' delay, the bugle sounded, Attention! The signal for the three chaplains to retire. The prisoners were then blindfolded, and the firing detail was marched within ten paces of the prisoners who were blindfolded. Whilst a breathless silence pervaded the audience of not less than 10,000 troops, ready, aim, fire, rang out on the clear summer air, and the 32 muskets belched forth their flaming tongues, and the five men fell dead upon their coffins. But little time was lost, as the troops, playing lively airs, returned to camp. 
an apparent cessation of important movements of both the Union and the Confederate Army now followed. On the 15th of September, 1863, General Halleck, by order of the President, urged General Meade to move upon Lee's army. It being known that Longstreet's corps had been detached from the Confederate Army and sent to Tennessee, and General Meade, therefore, issued orders for a forward movement. Then, following a series of maneuvering for position and strategic tactics completely bewildering to the men in the ranks took place, without results except overmarching and exhausting the troops. Both armies, like gladiators, sparring for positions, frequently moved up and down the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, crossing the Rappahannock and Rapidan, and occupying and retreating from Culpeper alternatively, so often as to almost to become monotonous. In fact, from this time on until winter set in, the country about the Rappahannock and along the line of the Orange and Alexandria Railroad became a chessboard on which General Lee and General Meade played a great game. It would be but a weary recital devoid of interest to the reader to narrate the many details of the movements of the rival armies during this period. It became a constant theme for newspapers in the North that the Army of the Potomac was simply a police guard for Washington, and also urging that it should renew operations before another winter set in, when campaigning and marching of armies on Virginia roads would be out of the question. Mine Run Campaign Bitter Cold On the 7th of November, General Meade put his troops in motion to force a passage of the Rappahannock. By a brilliant charge at Rappahannock Station, the 6th Corps, supported by the 5th, took the works and captured 1,600 prisoners. General David A. Russell, commanding the advance division of the 6th Corps, was mortally wounded in the charge. The 155th and Ayers Division were in the advance of the 5th Corps in this action. The two corps then crossed to the south side of the river and went into camp some four miles east of the railroad, occupying the log cabins constructed a few days before by the Confederates. As soon as the railroad was repaired, General Meade followed this move by deciding to cross the Rapidan and to advance rapidly towards Orange Courthouse. On the 23rd of November, Therefore, marching orders were issued, but, a severe storm occurring during the night, the movement was delayed until the morning of the 26th. The 5th Corps, under General Sykes, crossed at Germana Ford on the 28th of November. Disposition was made to attack the Confederates. After a march of several miles, the Confederates were found to have established themselves in strong fortifications on the west bank of Mine Run. The 5th Corps moved and took position at 4 o'clock a.m., the 29th, in a thick forest immediately in front of Mine Run and the enemy's works. The opposite bank of Mine Run at this point had an elevation of over 100 feet, with a gentle, smooth slope to the creek by over 1,000 yards. General Meade, having received favorable reports from his engineers, decided to make three assaults on the enemy's works. One on their left with the 5th and the 6th Corps, one on the center with the 1st and the 3rd, and one on the Confederate right with the other corps all under command of General G.K. Warren. After inspection of the Confederate position, General Meade concluded to abandon the center attack and to reinforce Warren's column with two divisions of the Third Corps, giving him nearly half the infantry under Meade's command. Orders were accordingly issued. The battle was to be opened by the Union batteries on the left firing at 8 o'clock a.m. on the 30th this being a signal for General Warren to make the main attack, and at nine o'clock, General John Sedgwick was to assault with his column. Warren decides enemy's position too strong to attack. Promptly, at eight o'clock on the morning of the 30th, the Union batteries opened. The skirmishers of the 1st and the 3rd Corps advanced across Mine Run and drove into the Confederate skirmishers and every preparation was made by General Sedgwick and others for the assault. Fifteen minutes rolled by, yet nothing was heard from General Warren. Three quarters of an hour passed, and still nothing was heard from Warren, and General Meade was fretting like a warhorse under curb. At ten minutes to nine o'clock, 
A dispatch was received by General Meade from General Warren to the effect that the position and strength of the enemy in Warren's present front seemed so formidable that he advised against making the attack, that the full light of the sun showed him that he could not succeed. General Meade rode to General Warren's headquarters and, after inspecting the position of the enemy and concurring in the opinion of General Warren that it was hopeless to make an attack, reluctantly abandoned the assault, and therefore, when night came, the third, fifth, and sixth corps returned to their former positions. General Meade, after mature deliberation, finding by this inspection that the Confederates had been working all night to render the only weak point in their position as strong as any other on their line, decided to withdraw his army. The newspaper war correspondent of the period bitterly arraigned General Meade for his action in abandoning the Mine Run campaign. These newspaper comments elicited a manly, courageous letter from General Meade, in which he declared that he stood ready at any time to surrender his sword and position as commander of the Union Army rather than willfully to sacrifice the precious lives of the men of his command, unnecessarily or without hope of great gain to the country. On the abandonment of the Mine Run Campaign, the 155th Regiment was on the 2nd of December, 1863 back at the Rappahannock Station, with the remainder of the Corps. The day following the regiment moved to Warrington, and was assigned the duty of guarding the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. On this duty, the Fifth Corps was disposed of by brigades at intervals along the line from Brandy Station to Fairfax, and in these winter camps the annals of the regiment for 1863 closes. The winter quarters were enjoyed, with all the pleasures and duties incident to the camps until May 2, 1864, when under General Grant, a new campaign was initiated in the wilderness. Incidents of the Mine Run Campaign 155th Regiment The experience at Mine Run was unique in the extreme from the fact that after the most extensive preparations for a battle, that had been made by the commander of the army under most cheerless and discouraging circumstances, no battle was fought. Scarcely had the movement of the army from Mine Run been undertaken by Meade at the end of a month of beautiful weather so well suited for campaigning than the most miserable, uncomfortable, and finally distressingly cold, freezing weather set in, embarrassing movement and causing the greatest suffering and also a shortage of rations. When General Sykes, commanding the 5th Corps, had amassed his column of 10,000 picked men concealed in the woods in front of the stream known as Mine Run, a magnificent view was afforded the troops of the fortified camps and positions occupied by the Confederate Army in winter quarters. It was noted that the small stream had been dammed in front of the Confederate position, thus producing so good a stage of water as to prevent a crossing immediately in front of their positions. On the opposite banks of the stream, many large trees had been chopped down and the limbs trimmed and placed as a cordon of obstructions which the attacking party would be compelled to climb over to take the works. Also, there was an area of ground in front of the Confederate fortifications of a half mile in width, necessary to be crossed under the complete range of the many batteries which frowned from the ramparts of the enemy's fortifications. After witnessing these bulwarks of the enemy, Many a veteran's mind, unbidden, averted to thought of similar embankment and terraced works, surmounted with Confederate guns faced by them at Fredericksburg. The order issued to General Sykes required a picked body of troops, 10,000 strong, to form in the adjacent woods, concealed from the enemy, and there to remain ready on the signal to charge these extraordinarily strong fortifications of the enemy. The assaulting columns would have been obliged to cross the stream of Mine Run in plain view of the enemy, to reform in line of battle after crossing, to climb over the Cheval de Frise and other obstructions defending the enemy's works, and then to march across the open plain in direct and enfilading range of the enemy's batteries. The tortures of the zero weather were aggravated by the prohibition of the generals in command that to conceal the presence in the woods of so large a body of Union troops prepared to charge, no fires to cook coffee or other warm food should be allowed, lest the curling smoke from the same should be discovered by the enemy and make known the position of the hostile hosts gathering to assault their works. 
155th, chosen for storming column, chaplains on duty. The 155th Regiment was selected for the post of honor in the storming column on the works at Mine Run. Knapsacks were unstrung and piled up in the rear. The faithful regimental chaplain, Dr. Mater, appeared and volunteered his services to take charge of the spare funds and keepsakes of any of the regiment who desired it, and also pinned the name of each soldier to the lapel of his blouse in view of the expected charge and the extreme probability of its heavy mortality to the ranks of the 155th, so that the bodies of the slain could be thus identified. The 9th Massachusetts Regiment, also selected for the storming column, being mostly composed of Irish citizens of Boston, Massachusetts, had a Catholic chaplain, Father C. L. Egan, who publicly administered the ceremony provided by his church of prayers of absolution to all soldiers going into battle. This venerable chaplain, standing on a stump or cliff in the woods, publicly invoked the blessing of Almighty God on all the troops there amassed, and eloquently prayed for the success of the Union Army. He also invoked divine forgiveness of sins to all present, about to offer their lives for their country. This scene was most impressive and inspiring, irrespective of creed. Many thousands of troops knelt in reverence to the good man's prayer that God might forgive them all their sins. No signal for the charge reached the troops selected and thus massed for the attack. As the day wore on, and the suffering from the cold and exposure became intense, as a culminating incident to the interesting situation of the troops thus awaiting the order for the attack, the medical supply wagons and ambulances, with the corps of doctors and stretcher-bearers, arrived in the same woods in the rear of the troops. The medical supply wagons with surgical instruments and other material were at once unloaded, and tents for field hospitals were immediately put up in plain sight of the troops, all of which was far from inspiring. The only gruesome particulars omitted from this depressing proceeding being coffins and ready-made graves. The assaulting column, however, remained until nightfall, when it was understood that a further inspection of the enemy's lines by General Warren, who had been given command of the charging columns to open the attack, had revealed the fact that the enemy had discovered, as Warren had reported to General Meade, the weakest part of their defenses, and that the enemy had occupied the night previous in strengthening that particular point, so that when the fog subsided in the morning, and Warren and his scouts renewed their inspection, Preparatory to giving the signal agreed upon for the assaulting columns, Warren made the report already quoted to General Meade, and the attack had to be abandoned. Thus, in no previous battle in which the regiment had participated had there been such elaborate preparations, or such harrowing accompaniments, or such manifest determination of the men to make the attack, as marked Mine Run. And yet it was a battle that never came off although it is inscribed upon the regimental colors. It deserves, however, to rank as a great battle for the sufferings endured and for the maintenance and position for the attack in plain view of the enemy for so long a period. The Confederates never left their formidable works to make an attack or an advance at Mine Run against Meade's army. The only hostile demonstration was, in their anxiety to find out what was in the dense woods sheltering the storming column in which the 155th was assigned, the shelling of these woods by the Confederate batteries, which during the day dropped several shells into the same, in military parlance was merely intended as feeling for the enemy. It was most fortunate for the Union arms, as the sequel showed, that no battle was fought by General Meade at Mine Run as the Confederates had devoutly prayed that he should do, for it would have been an engagement under the most adverse and discouraging circumstances, and quite likely attended with great loss of life and the accomplishment of little good. A Poem in Between, page 214 and 215 Sweet little Major, he mounts my knee, and the tender blue eyes look at me. Tell me, Papsy, just once more, what did you do when you went to war? Say, tell me, Papsy, say you will, how many rebels did you kill? So I told him the truth, or as near as might be, as many of them as they did of me. Union Army returns to old camps. Reenlistments set in. 
is what we will pick up next week as the army heads into winter quarters. Now let's bring up some notes I took for this episode, several things to focus on and chat about. Uh, the new division commander for the 155th, I'm going to go ahead and put a link for him so you can read all about him and all of the stuff he's done, I guess. Also, Meade's letter after the Battle of Gettysburg that he gave to the army. It must have felt like they were outnumbered by the rebels from the way that they were getting attacked. But obviously that was incorrect. The Union army outnumbered the rebels that time. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, the brave boys of K, Company K, Company E, and Company A. Capturing those rebels at breakfast is beyond hilarious. Because you just know those guys were like eating some flapjacks or something. And they look out the window and there's just some a horde of Union soldiers outside being like, time to come outside. I wonder if they let them finish their breakfast or not. I would have. I would have been like, yo, eat your bacon. Come on, we're going. Uh, followed by Meade delaying the attack on Robert E. Lee's army as they were trapped on the river. And then the rebels slipping away at the last minute as some sort of like divine, terrible charm that existed for both armies at this time. I know General Lee complained so many times about his own victories because he never actually beat the army of the Potomac. It always slipped away to lick its wounds, just like he slips away to lick his wounds and the war just continues on for two more years. Let's see what else I got here. Uh, the 155th eating crushed hardtack and berries. Sounds terrible, yet delicious. When I do my march through Maryland and Gettysburg, which is coming up, guys, it's in 90 days, I might add, which is insane to me. Uh, I'll make sure I'll do it for you guys. It's a special part of history, so right, it's part of the historical record. Blackberries and hardtack. I mean, I could do it right now. I've got hardtack in my kitchen because I've been cooking it. Oh, Lord. So I'll make sure that I do that. I'll take a video of it too. So I swear that this regiment arrives at every major moment of the war, like it's a Civil War version of Forrest Gump, but for like hundreds of men. When they talked about the draft riots and that they might, they expected to go, I was like, oh, okay. Like, of course these guys would be there, but... I mean, I'm glad they missed at least one historical thing that was significant in the Civil War, but it seems like they've been to them all. We've got the My Run campaign. is actually pretty fascinating. I've included on my website about a four-minute video, four or five-minute video from the Battlefield Trust where they talk about Mine Run, and we'll just throw that in there. They even talk about how, you know, about French as well, just like they just made fun of him in this book, just like they made fun of him in this regimental history. Gosh, how much must it suck to be laying on the ground while it's freezing? You're at the front of an assault position. So you know you're going to die if you're going to attack this position. And you're at the very front. And it's freezing cold. And you're trying not to freeze to death. And then every now and then an artillery shell is just landing in the forest that you have to worry about. You have to stay quiet. You can't have a fire. You're just eating your hard tag or sucking on it, I guess. And then on top of that, the tents show up and they start being like, well, here's where you're going to be after you get shot and killed or wounded. Just awful. I'm glad that there was no battle at Mine Run. I, I really am. Sounds like an awful time. So I'm glad they, it didn't happen to them. Uh, and I also felt that poem was like a great way to end the episode. So I just stopped it there and we'll continue on for next week. I think I'm just going to read all the way through. Might be a little bit longer of an episode for me reading, so be prepared for that. In my other news, I really am marching to Gettysburg, guys. Like, this is really happening. So I have some marching slash hiking to do this weekend. Saturday and Sunday, I'll be doing some additional training. This is lunacy. I know I briefly touched on it a while ago that I'm going, but like I'm doing this in complete Union Army, historically accurate gear, food, weapon, instruments, and I'm going to be following the same route that the 5th Corps did on its way to Gettysburg, 
which took me a long time to like track down and figure out like I'm having to do all of this on my own. So it's a lot of walking, a lot of training with all the gear I've had it, you know, I've got the knapsack and some of the other things, canteen and cartridge box and all the other stuff that and I've been wearing it with while I've been going out and hiking and without everything extra. So just like the physical gear that they wore, it's about as heavy as like modern day body armor. So it's not that bad. And it's been very similar to hikes that I've already done and things that I've already done. So what I'm saying is I've been easily able to <laughs> like move through the uncomfortableness of it being like, yeah, this is, in fact, I might add, uh, it actually aggravates my old wounds from the same spots, shoulders, side of the hips and that kind of thing. So that was, that's, you know, it's one thing we don't think about with veterans what actually happens to your body when you chafe it every day. Uh, I have permanent skin damage as much as I try not to. And I put on all sorts of stuff, uh, where my body armor rubbed against my skin day after day after day. It just, it's never healed properly. Uh, I've also been practicing my soldier cooking. So I'm going to start off in late June and reach Gettysburg, hopefully on the first through the third, be there for the anniversary this year. I've got about half of the planning stage finished so far. So when it's time and I'm ready to go, I'll put up a picture of me carrying all of everything. And I'll do a complete breakdown on my YouTube channel of everything that I'm taking with me. So you guys can look at it because I'm not taking everything as historically accurate. I'm still taking my phone, I'm still taking a battery, a charger, like, you know, that kind of stuff. But for a lot of it, all the food I'm going to be eating is just going to be army rations. Oh, man. Anyway, that's going to be up on my YouTube channel, which only has one practice recording video on it that I made. So this will be a nice way to kick it off, I suppose. And I'll be doing the whole thing from there. It's not going to be through my podcast. You'll have to go to my YouTube channel to look at the hike when I'm done with it. And I'll probably do very short, small episodes for anyone who wants to follow along from my podcast. And then once I get back, cause I'm just using a GoPro, uh, then you'll be able to really look at it um, or I'll be able to really edit and put things together, I suppose. So I just want to let you know, like this is really happening. Like I am really am crazy. I'm going to walk across Maryland and Pennsylvania on a road march. And, oh boy, this is going to be crazy. This episode would have been out sooner, but I had a house emergency that had to be taken care of right away. And that severely cut into my time to finish my editing. So I just kind of had to like wing it. So I do apologize for this episode being a little late, but with that, my friends, I'm going to take off. I have a ton of work to do. I have more hardtack to bake. I have. Oh. Why did everything get so busy so soon? Like, subscribe, give me five stars, four stars. In fact, yeah, just give me five stars. That works just fine. And leave a comment. You can come to my website. It's not going to be a whole lot. There's not a whole lot of pictures this time, but there's a few. I'll put those up my on the post for the website, along with some links. You should probably be able to get in and out in like 10 minutes on this post so see you guys next week have a fantastic weekend they will find him and know him among the good and true bye, -bye. when a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue no more the bugle calls the weary one rest noble spirit in thy grave alone They will find you and know you Amongst the good and true When a robe of white is given for That faded coat of blue He cried, give me water 
and just one little crumb, and my mother, she will bless you through all the years to come. Go tell my sweet sister, so gentle, good, and true, that I'll meet her up in heaven or in my faded coat of blue. No more the bugle calls the weary one. Rest, noble spirit, in thy grave alone. They will find you and know you amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded 